What's up, Vine? How you doing, buddy? I've been on for about three days anyway. Okay. Hope you guys can see me. Can you hear me? All right. May the Father be out of me, Lord Jesus be out of me, Holy Spirit be out of me, with the beauty of Jesus shining through me for the glory of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill us in Jesus' name. Okay. It's been a couple days. I feel older. Yeah, some people are wondering. Yeah, Vine, I just got back after three days. Someone was saying, hmm, all the dieting. No, it's the stress. Stress is the number one killer, right? A lot of stress, folks. Broken body. You know, so many of you have been wanting to hear the outcome about my situation. I have no idea. I haven't received any word regarding the outcome. So I'm left in suspense. And to be honest, you guys, I give up on it. I don't care anymore. Yeah. I don't care anymore. You know, I, I what can you do? Uh, hopefully... If Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, is pleased, I'll be out of it sooner than later. Hopefully, the new year will new year will bring in a new year blessing in Jesus' name. You know, whatever happens, happens. I don't know. I know he is uh, Delroy, but you know, it just this world, man. These satanic distractions, right? Let me just share share this. It is an honor, a badge of honor, when Christians get persecuted, in prison, tortured, even killed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's an honor when someone is thrown in jail for taking a stand for biblical truth, right? For example, traditional marriage and opposes any type of relationship that's contrary to God's ordained <clears throat> institution of marriage, holy matrimony between males and females. Right. If you go to jail for that, glory to the triune God, glory to the Father, glory to the Lord Jesus, the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit that you get persecuted for that. Or if they throw you in prison because you won't compromise on the gospel of Jesus Christ or deny the Bible's God's word, glory to the Father, glory to the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, glory to the Holy Spirit. They, they are worthy, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three eternal persons who eternally exist as one God. They are worthy. We suffer for them, that we stand for their word. <clears throat> And we die for the word in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will count me worthy to suffer for righteousness sake, but to suffer for something like this. <sighs> Come on, right? Uh, Simon, I didn't ask for your opinion. I mean, I thank you, sir. I'm glad you think Muhammad wasn't a good moral example. I didn't ask for your opinion as an atheist, whether you think Jesus is a good man or not. To be honest, because the claims that the historical Jesus made, no good man who was sane would make those claims. But I don't want to get into that because I'm not here to engage your position. And one thing I just want to be clear. Let me just be clear. I know there's a time and place where we work with people for a common cause and expose evil ideologies that can affect affect us here on this side of glory, socially, politically, economically, right? Militarily. So that's why you'll find David Wood, a former atheist who now worships the true God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, will do shows with apostate prophet. And apostate prophet will do shows with David Wood, and they will plug each other's YouTube channels. Because there comes a time and place in which <clears throat> Christians may want to work with people of a different ideology for a common good on this side of glory in order to save us socially, politically, economically, militarily, right? But in reality, here, let me share some with you. Let me just share this with you. Yeah. I just saw a video by, what's the name of the channel? The Dean Show. Eddie of the Dean Show, whom I met, okay? I met him. Very humble guy. Very good guy. He just called Muslims to petition against Netflix blasphemous, blasphemous series portraying Jesus Christ and his apostles as homosexuals. Utter blasphemy. Utter blasphemy. He just did a video. I just watched it about an hour ago saying that though we have differences, Muslims and Christians, and though we will never 
agree on those differences, we can still learn to work together on this side of glory until the day of judgment. Like God sift out the differences, whether Jesus is God or not. But we need to support Christians and petition against Netflix blaspheming Jesus because Jesus is a mighty prophet. And we want to show our solidarity because when they insult Jesus, they insult us. You get my point? And you guys, please. Complain to Netflix because they wouldn't do that with Muhammad. Okay, now what's my point? What's my point? Will you take up arms with Muslims and fighting a common cause? For example, this same Muslim calls Christians to fight against the evil, destructive influence of atheism and secularism. And yet you, here you have an atheist saying that he is all... On board with Muhammad being immoral, but Jesus being good. You get my point? Who do you side with? Whose side do you take? Whose side do you take? For example, apostate prophet is not a militant atheist who hates theists of any stripe. But do you think you can work alongside of a Richard Dawkins? And share a platform with Richard Dawkins speaking out against the evil of Islam and Muhammad. You sure about that, Adam and Eve? So that means you'll share a platform with Richard Dawkins who hates your Jesus just as much as he hates Muhammad. Thank you, Sai Christian. Thank you. And that comes from Sai Christian who hates Islam and knows Muhammad is a son of Satan. You get my point? So where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Now, if you guys are wondering why I titled this session, even though it, it's partly clickbait, it's not the primary reason. The reason why I titled the session, the, the, the question Christian Prince cannot answer is because of a Mohammedan that's here. His name is I Am A Sinner. He's here. I invited him to come. Yeah, here we go. The Trinity. Hey, um... Trinity delusion, you're a delusion because you think you're human, but you're a dog. And I know you're upset to this day that you don't know who fathered you. Blame your mother for that, not us. Anyway, here it goes. I've been gone three days and the demons come out. Anyway, coming back to the issue. Let's come back to the issue. Uh, Trinity delusion, can you set up a debate on your channel? And I promise you, I will utterly humiliate you that no one will ever take you seriously. Can you set up a debate on your channel? I'll come to your channel. We'll do a live stream discussion on your channel so I can retire you by the grace of Jesus, your God and Savior and Judge. Right. Hey, the demons are manifesting. You see that, right? All these filthy demons like Simon James. I know Trinity Delusion. It's going to take me less than 10 minutes to muzzle you like the dog you are. I'm saying, can you invite me to your channel? Let's do a live discussion so I can embarrass you on your channel and silence and expose you for the son of Satan that you are. Yes or no? Do you take me up on your offer? Yes or no? All right. Anyway, admin, do me a favor. Block all these sons of Satan. These dogs are barking. Yeah, I can do that very easy. I can embarrass you and show you that very easy. <clears throat> hold on, hold on. Let me not, Let me expose this guy. Hold on. Angela, you're very quick. Angela, calm down. Relax, breathe. Okay, Trinity, name me the sources that predate 200. You see how he arbitrarily sets the date? What sources do you have that predate 200? Because I'm assuming that you are stupid enough to be referring to the church fathers, not to the New Testament documents. If you do, I'll further embarrass you with the New Testament documents. My question is, Trinity Delusion, name me the sources that predate the year 200. Let's see how smart you are. Oh, okay. So if I show you from the from the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is God, you'll admit that you're a son of Satan and you're upset that you don't know your father is because to this day your mother doesn't know who fathered you. Will you admit that? Now, sadly, I don't have the guys, the admins. We don't have the admins here that post Bible verses. There's no Protestant and there is no first and the last. So I'm going to have to read the verses for myself. 
Are they here on the channel or no? If not, does anyone is anyone here? Did he say something blasphemous? Okay, just then block him then. Yeah, yeah. Then block him. Block him. Admins block him. Send him back to his to his mother. Yeah, Trinity. The reason why he is a Mohammedan, Sam, he's a Mohammedan. He is <clears throat> using the moniker Trinity Delusion because that is a YouTube channel and a website by this very nasty, old, disgusting-looking anti-Trinitarian who claimed to be a Trinitarian. Nasty. Just You can see he's angry and just bitter. All right? All right. Now, let's focus, guys. In Jesus' name, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, we ask that you cleanse us and wash us and purify us in the holy blood of your beloved son, Jesus, your heart made flesh. And Father, forgive us for our moral failures. Crucify our flesh. Save us from our flesh. Save us from our lustful desires and anything and everything that's contrary to the Spirit and fill us with fruit from the Spirit, life from the Spirit, power from the Spirit, wisdom and knowledge, understanding from the Spirit, holiness and purity from the Spirit. And give us the power of your Spirit to live and the victory wrought by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, the victory of the cross of Jesus, because we are more than conquerors, Father. Give us the grace to conquer our flesh, conquer Satan and this evil world that comes against us because we belong to Jesus. And cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones with the holy blood of Jesus. And Father, grant me clarity of thought and speech. Save me from error and stammering and confusion, Father. Bless your people, fill them with wisdom and knowledge to know the word and to be taken to a higher level, all of us, a higher, higher level of trust, of hope, of love, of faith, and of worship, because we need to worship you and love you more. We don't love you enough. We don't love Jesus enough. We don't love the Spirit enough. Have mercy on us, Father. We need you. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save us from attacks of the enemy. <clears throat> Bind up all attacks and all evil influences by shielding us with the blood of Jesus and the wall of fire from the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay. Okay, for those of you asking me about Thursday, I don't know. I haven't received any word what happened. And let me just be very upfront and frank with you guys. And Sahih Christian can testify. Unless, unless you find an attorney that sold out for Jesus Christ, in love with Jesus Christ and honor Jesus Christ above and beyond their personal gain and finances, even the attorneys that work for you don't care about you. I just want you to know this. And I think you guys know this already. Inside Christian can amen that. Listen, folks, on this side of glory, see, on this side of glory, everyone is corrupt. Everyone is corrupt. The judicial system is so bankrupt and corrupt and so evil, it's from the pit of hell, right? Even the attorneys that work for you don't care, and sometimes they're in cahoots. So if you're trusting in a fallible, imperfect, wicked, evil attorney that's human, who's not even born of the Spirit, then you know what? <clears throat> you are a fool, and I say this generally, not you specifically. You'll be disappointed. You need to know. Let me remind you guys. Let me remind you guys. You need to know the only hope you have, the only <clears throat> trust that you, <clears throat> you put your entire hope and trust in is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Only Jesus and Jesus alone is all-powerful to preserve you and save you no matter what happens. He will seal you by his almighty spirit and cover you by his blood. Everything else that comes from the world Everything else on this side of glory, everything else that originates from human beings, <clears throat> if you put your trust in that, you're going to be sad. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be <clears throat> heartbroken, miserable, depressed, and bitter. So may the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, save us from trusting in corrupt legal systems and corrupt attorneys and wicked, evil judges who are whores. Of the devil, may the Lord Jesus severely chasten them from corrupt politicians and corrupt politics and give us the grace to trust in him, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and in his word, the Holy Bible, completely, perfectly, and totally 
right? In Jesus' name. That's it. I'm telling you. In fact, I don't know. We don't have anyone quoting Bible verses, right? So I'm going to read the verses aloud right here. Let me read to you. I'm going to read to you guys Jeremiah 17. Verses 5 to 8, okay? So, guys, I'm going to have to read the passages because we don't have Protestant believer or first last to post for us. I'm reading modern English version, the modernized version of the King James. Forgive me for that. I know many of you want me to stick with the King James. And I do believe the King James is the perfect translation of God's words in English, preserved by God, the chief of all English translations for over 300 years. And God was pleased to use that and all its specific readings to produce Christians sold out for the glory of Jesus. So I honor and cherish that translation. Okay. Hater Woods here. Okay, let me read to you. Thus says Yahovah. Pay attention, folks. Thus says Yahovah. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Did you catch it? Cursed are you if you trust in man, a human being. Man here is inclusive, male or female. Put your hope in a human being. Depend on a human being, whether male or female. And makes flesh his strength. In other words, your entire hope is on human beings. And whose heart departs from Yahovah, Jehovah. For he will be like a bush in the desert. And will not see when good comes. Nothing good will come for you. But will inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. In a salt land not inhabited. But now let's read 7 and 8. Guys, pay attention. 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahovah. You are blessed. You are happy. If you're trusting in the triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, completely and perfectly, no matter what you see with your eyes, no matter what happens around you. And whose hope is Yahovah, Jehovah. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out its roots by the river and shall not fear when he comes. But its leaf shall be green, and it shall not be anxious in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now, why should you not trust flesh human beings? Only the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all things, and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Let me read it again. The heart is more deceitful than all things, and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Right? Did you catch it? Is it making sense? So, so don't think you have anyone fighting for you. The lawyers, even the ones you hire, don't care about you. They're lying. Unless they're sold out for Jesus and love with Jesus and fear Jesus, right? They don't care about you. They don't care what the decision is. They don't care if the judge destroys you. It's, it's You're just a dollar sign. Only God can care for you and fight for you. Right? Okay, now, with that said, let me explain the title, the title for today. I haven't been able to get on because I didn't have access to internet. At my brother's house, they were occupied preparing for Christmas. And today, I was able to come to child of God's home and by his graciousness and and. And love and sacrifice, he allowed me to use his room to do this live stream. But he's been busy as well with guests and family. Because don't forget, Christmas is around the corner. And Dave Dewitt is getting fat. So please put a penny in that fat man's hat. Right? Anyway, don't forget, Lord Jesus willing, Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow I'm going to live stream with Hater Wood, the world's greatest hater and white dictator. Right? Jealous that the Assyrian... Assassin, the Babylonian bruiser makes him look like a loser. But anyway, coming back to the subject by the grace of Jesus. The reason why I call the session the question Christian Prince cannot answer is because there's someone, I think he ran. I hope he didn't run. I love I am a sinner. He asked this question on Christian Prince's uh channel in one of his YouTube videos, and Christian Christian Prince answered it. So I decided to do an entire session refuting this question because it comes up over and over and over and over again. And we've answered it over and over and over again. And yet we got to keep answering the same question over and over and over again because 
First and foremost, if there is a sincere Muslim who's sincerely asking, he or she will get the answer with the hopes that the Holy Spirit will take our meager efforts, convict those Muslims to see the truth and the beauty of the true Jesus and turn to him or at least stop using these bad arguments. And it will also benefit Christians because the more Christians hear the answer to a common objection, the better off they will be in being able to then thoroughly refute that objection by the grace of the triune God. Because though we've answered this question over and over again, I hear Christians still answering the question in a less than adequate manner, though they've heard the answer to the objection. And yet they keep repeating the same inadequate response. I know we're creatures of rep repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature. But folks, please learn the arguments and use these arguments and the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Don't repeat the same inadequate responses. And what's the question? When I say that Christian prince cannot answer, obviously he answered it, right? So it's, it's clickbait as well. But I don't know if he's here. I am sinner. Are you here? What happened? Did you run? Are you here? I said I was going to make you famous, man. I want to answer your question. Did he leave? Are there Muslims here? Because I want to interact with Muslims. As long as they keep it respectful, interact with Muslims. And you'll see why this objection can be turned around against Muhammad with greater damage, exposing Muhammad as an antichrist, a false prophet. Okay? But I guess there are no Muslims. Now, can you guess what the question is? And Grace Girl, I'm in the midst of a discussion, and you're telling me, please come to the room if you can. How can I? I can't multitask, so can you just focus and <clears throat> ask me questions in the YouTube channel, not on Facebook, Grace Girl? Okay. Molak, you're a Muslim? Okay, good. Okay, now Molak or Mo Moalek. Uh, yeah, Moalek as Fox. Okay. You Mohammedans often ask the Christian, show us a single place where Jesus says, I am God or worship me and you'll be Christian. Are you one of those Muslims that like to ask this objection or raise this objection, ask this question? As the Lord Jesus anoints me by his spirit to speak clearly with power from the spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yep, you got it, Cruz. I just want to say, Malik, will he also say yes? That's a question we ask. Let's see if Malik is not ashamed to defend his religion and interact on a serious scholarly level. Let's see. Or is he just here to do a hit and run and waste our time? All right. Jason Berg, I hate the fact that you're still upset that your mother doesn't know who fathered you. Friend, can you give me your number so I can chew her out for giving birth to a dog like you, friend? Because I'm upset for you. And I'm upset that she hasn't neutered you yet. Admins, get rid of these guys. Come on, quick, madmins. Come on, help me, help you. Come on. Molek, are you there? Angela, where are you when I need you? Yeah. These guys can think they're going to come here, mock the Trinity, blaspheme the Trinity, and get away with it. Uh, Molek, can you answer the question? Stop running to Skype. If I knew how to do that, believe me, I'd have you. In fact, invite me to your channel. Invite me to your channel this week, and I promise you I'll embarrass you on your channel, and I'll embarrass your prophet. But answer the question. Can you answer the question? Stop pretending that you know what you're talking about, that you're a writer. Because even your prophet couldn't write, nor could your God. So unless you're better and smarter than your prophet, you're no writer either. Can you answer the question or no? Where is your love? That's what happens when you come here arrogantly. I'm a writer. No, you're not. You follow an illiterate nomad whose God was illiterate. So if you're a writer, that means you're smarter and better than your God and his messenger. Hey, first last is here. Good man. Maybe you can post verses for me. But Malik, are you going to answer? You're going to waste our time. Making dua to the black stone is not going to help you. It didn't help your prophet. 
Let's see if he's going to answer. If not, we're going to send him on his merry way. We're wasting time here. Okay, let's see. Hey, first last, can you post verses or yeah? Okay, so Molek, are you going to answer? Guys, slow down on the text. Molek said he's going to text. Okay, so Molek, are you one of those Muslims that like to use the argument? Show me where Jesus says, I am God, or worship me. Do you think that's a valid argument? Sorry, guys, for delay, because we have a Muslim engaging me. Exactly, John Doe. If you're going to insult the Trinity, the Lord Jesus, and mock the Trinity, the Lord Jesus, and those who worship the triune God and Jesus is God, then, guys, you can get upset, upset at me all you want. I'm going to tear you into shreds, and I'm going to embarrass you and humiliate you for insulting and blaspheming our God, the triune God, and those who worship him. You don't like it? Find another channel, Christians. Yes, yeah, we're going to probably just get rid of this guy. He's wasting our time. Okay, I am sinner. You're here. All right, good. Okay, guys, here's the guy, the star of the show. He ran. I guess he was trying to make dua to the black stone, hoping the black stone would answer him like the prophets of Baal. All right, now I am sinner. Are you ready? Okay. Your question to CP that you said he couldn't answer is, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? So you consider that a valid objection? Now, by the way, I am sinner. I am sinner. Okay. You are a Muslim. And if you say you're not a Muslim, you're going to have to tell us what you believe or I'm going to block you. Okay. So, Malik. Okay. Now, Malik, you just exposed Muhammad as an antichrist. Is Allah the father of Jesus, Malik? Now, notice how stupid Malik is. He quotes Jesus in John 17, 3. John 17, 3. Thinking this now refutes Christianity, but it proves Muhammad is an antichrist, an agent of the devil. Malik, is Allah the father of Jesus? Malik, is Allah the father of Jesus? Let's see if any of these guys are going to answer the questions. They're wasting our time. If not, we're just going to block them, and I'll teach you how to respond to these objections. Malik, is Allah the father of Jesus? See, they, they don't answer. Yeah. Send Mitchell back to his mother so that his mother can tell him who fathered him. Molek, if you don't answer, then you're a coward. You're ashamed of your prophet, and I'm going to block you. Molek, answer the question. Is Allah the father of Jesus? You just said that the only true God is the father, the father of Jesus Christ. Is Allah the father of Jesus? Now, Botox is telling us what his mother does for a living. Botox, we know that's what your mother does, but don't get upset at Jesus because that's what your mother do did and does. Final chance, Malik, I'm going to send you to Mecca. Is Allah the father of Jesus? Now, I'm sinner. You got less than a minute to tell me what your religion is. We're going to block you. Notice Malik, he's ashamed of his prophet. You see how ashamed he is? He can't answer questions because he knows his prophet was a pedophile who raped women and also treated them as whores. He treated women like his mother, like prostitutes, calling it muta. So he can't answer a question. Malik, I'm embarrassed for you. I'm ashamed for you. Now send them on their merry way. Send them out of here. Don't waste their time with these kids anymore. Block. Admins start blocking. You see, they can't answer questions. They can't answer questions. You see that? Block them, admins. We don't need time for these clowns, these wicked clowns, these cowards. The only time these, these cowards, these Mohammedans are men, only time Muhammad Niqab is a man is when they surround you as part of a group of jihadis who want to behead you for all in his messenger and then rape your women folk, following the spirit of Muhammad according to the Quran and his traditions. Sorry, Muslims. I'm going to call a spade and spade. I'm not going to be politically correct. I am accurately representing the teachings of your prophet and his example. You don't like it? Condemn Muhammad to hell and turn to Jesus, your only hope of salvation. Right? Okay, everyone there? Okay, so let's send these guys on their merry way. Now let me teach you how to answer these objections. Though I have answered them before, 
I will answer these objections again. But here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. You guys are going to learn these arguments, make these arguments second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you start using these arguments and not inadequate ones. That's your promise to me. If you believe God has called me to teach you and God has called me to serve him in ministry, doing apologetics, teaching theology, and equipping the church for the glory of Jesus, here's how you're going to honor me. You're going to learn the arguments, trusting the Holy Spirit to enable you to understand the arguments, to recall the arguments, making it second nature, and teach others as you continue to pray for me and my daughters that God will preserve us for his glory, that we never shame Jesus, never deny Jesus, never blaspheme Jesus, but live for Jesus and die for Jesus because he's worthy. Amen? That's what I want you to partner with me. This is how I want you to covenant with me. This will be our covenant relationship, right? Yeah. Diva, I know that's what your mother did, but don't tell us your mother's occupation. Hide it, Diva. Hide what your mother does. You see the demons are out, right? Manifesting. And if the Christians are wondering why I'm insulting their mothers, if I repeat what they just said about Jesus, what they accuse Jesus of, the nastiest, wicked, sickest blasphemy, I can't repeat it. I can't even give you a G-rated version. So if you guys don't like me insulting their mothers for giving birth to such dogs and bastards of the devil, don't come to my channel and don't you dare accuse me of not being Christ-like. You insult Jesus, I'm going to insult you. We're going to come to blows. Not that I'm going to attack you, but I'm going to tell you something that's going to get you angry enough to attack me. And then it's self-defense by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, for the rest of you, as we're cleaning house and getting rid of the demons and the cowards are too ashamed to defend Muhammad, this antichrist of the devil. Okay. Can we answer that question for the final time? And hopefully I won't have to repeat the answer. Right? Hopefully I won't have to repeat the answer. If a Muslim asks you, and guys, you should know the answer by now because we've done shows on this. I have articles on this. I've done sessions on this. So has David Wood. Everyone and his mother that's involved in apologetics to Islam. We have answered this thoroughly. Let me tell you how not to answer the question. If someone tells you, show me where Jesus says, I am God or worship me, you don't go and quote to them, I and my father are one. You don't go and quote to them, he who sees me sees the father. You don't go and quote to them, before Abraham was born, I am. Right? You don't go and quote those passages to them because they'll say, see, you didn't answer my question. You didn't answer my question. I said, show me where Jesus says, I am God in those exact words or where he says, worship me in those exact words. You get it? So I'll say, so if you show me where Jesus says, he who sees me says the father, that's not answering the question. So they want you to quote Jesus saying he is God in those exact words or saying worship me in those exact words. So please do me a favor. Do me a favor. Don't answer the question in a wrong manner. Don't answer the question in a wrong manner because they're setting you up to then try to embarrass you in front of the Muslims. Their goal is is to get Muslims to see how irrational and stupid we are and that we're incapable of answering the objection. Are you with me? So when you fall for their trick, their trap, then what you're doing is you're, you're allowing them to dull meat to their, to their fan base. You see? Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! No, 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 no. You embarrass him and his prophet in the sight of the Muslims. Humiliate him and his prophet in the sight of the Muslims. They'll be embarrassed to ever raise that objection again. So you know what you do? Say, excellent question, but I have a question too, and I promise I'll answer. You as a Mohammedan who follows the Quran, you believe Jesus is the Messiah, the virgin-born son of Mary, the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary, and a spirit from him. That's chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 171. Guys, please, you've heard the answer. Hear it again. Use it in this manner. Don't answer it any other way. So chapter 4, verse 170 of the Quran says, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of Mary, an apostle of Allah. His word, Kalimatuhu, the word of Allah, which he cast down to Mary and his spirit from him. So I will become a Muslim. 
God will not humiliate me because the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, loves me. He's in love with me, and he's in love with all true believers who are covered by the blood of Jesus. But the true God did humiliate your prophet Muhammad and expose him for a son of Satan and a dog who's burning in hell. And he'll humiliate you for defending this wicked, evil antichrist until you repent. So the Lord Jesus rebuke and chasten you and shut your mouth in Jesus' name. Now, coming back to the issue. And that's for AK-47, who's upset that he doesn't know who fathered him through Muta. He's upset that his mother, when she did Muta, she doesn't know which man sired him because of Muta marriage. Okay? No, you're not. You're no Christian. You are a son of Satan, you wicked antichrist, child of the devil. Okay? Yeah, because you're being very Christ-like attacking. You see, you hypocrite, you are of your father, the devil. Enjoy it that you're getting humiliated in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Now, come back to the issue. When you show them that's what the Quran says, what that's what the Quran says, then you ask them the question. Are you ready? Are you ready to ask them the question? Show me in your Quran where Isa says, I am the Messiah in those exact words. Show me in the Quran where Isa, your Jesus says, I am the virgin born son of Mary in those exact words. Show me in your Quran where Isa says, I am the word of God, which he cast down to Mary in those exact words. Show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am a spirit from Allah, a spirit from him in those exact words. Show me in those exact words, Jesus saying all the things you say about him. And I'll become Muslim. Okay. Now I've answered this question the same way for years. So has David Wood. So has others. The fact that Christians who follow us and listen to us keep repeating the same inadequate response tells me either we're not good teachers or you're not good listeners. Because if we're good teachers, then you're not good listeners because you're not using this argument. Why not? All right? Alpha Omega, actually your God, Alpha and Omega, let me answer the question for you. According to your Quran, your God breathed his spirit in a woman's vulva vagina. That's chapter 66, verse 12. So if you have a problem with the Bible, then that means you just buried your God in hell and exposed him for the demon he is, for being so filthy and wicked and nasty for talking about breathing his spirit into a woman's vagina. Chapter 66, verse 12, the Quran. 66, verse 12. So your God is a wicked porn star. Now, admins, Angela, be quick. You're not blocking people quick enough. Now, folks, how do you think a Muslim is going to respond to that? Yeah, they're very upset today. Have you noticed? Because we're embarrassing them. We're embarrassing them, exposing their prophet for the son of Satan that he is, and showing how glorious and beautiful the triumph God truly is. All glory to Jesus. Now, how do you think a Muslim is going to respond? And by the way, I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to prove to you the Quran uses graphic, wicked, blasphemous language to describe Mary's conception of Jesus. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. Their response will be, if they're smart, well, the Quran says it, Jesus doesn't need to say it. You with me there? Allah says it in the Quran, so Jesus doesn't need to say it. Say, well, thank you for falling into my trap. Because then I can show you where God says Jesus is God without Jesus having to say it. If you demand Jesus has to say it, then I demand the same, same of you. But if you're going to say, well, as far as my beliefs as a Muslim, Jesus doesn't have to say it. Allah says in the Quran, that's good enough for you. Well, guess what? God in the Bible says he's God. That's good enough for us. What's your next objection? Stop using arguments that I can turn against you to expose you and embarrass your prophet. Right? Do you see how to answer the question? For those of you saying, nice, good. That means from now on, from now on, that's how you're going to answer this objection, right? From now on? From now on. That's how you're going to answer the objection, correct? In other words, I will not hear inadequate answers to a question we have answered 
for over 20 years. This answer has been the consistent answer we've given for about 20 years. You should know the argument and know how to address it thoroughly by now. Either we're bad teachers or you're bad listeners. So do not repeat an inadequate answer from now on. You promise me because that's what you're doing. We're entering into a covenant relationship. We're going to covenant with one another that you're going to learn these arguments thoroughly. Trust the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand the arguments, absorb them to become second nature, because I want all of you to share the arguments because we want to multiply this information until it spreads throughout the entire world as a witness to the whole world that the triune God lives. Jesus is the God man and the Bible is his word. But you got to do your part. You got to do your part. Side note, I'm going to answer this thoroughly. Side note, for my brothers and sisters in Christ like Zarina, Stop posting memes that are not biblically correct. They're catchy, they're preachy, but they're not correct. For example, our sister posted a meme saying, I have a relationship, I don't have religion. No, Zarina. No, you're wrong. The Bible says you have a relationship and a religion. See, the admins are not quick. What's admins? Are you guys that slow? Why is it I'm catching this guy? You guys are sleeping. If you guys don't want to add me, let me know. I'll remove you because the guy just bombarded the room and you're sleeping. Come on, guys. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Come on, do a better job for the pay you don't get. Do a better job for the pay you don't get. Okay? Now, let's come back to the issue. Stop. Stop sharing memes or... Passing on statements that are biblically incorrect. Christians have a relationship with the triune God, but they also have a religion because a religion is a way of life. God has prescribed a way of life for believers. And this way of life is distinct from other ways of life, of life, right? And so a religion is basically a way of life. It tells you how to live, how to worship, how to conduct yourself, in relation to the deity that you acknowledge as your God. And the Bible speaks of a true religion, a pure religion that God accepts every one of us to embrace. James 1, 26 to 27. So folks, do me a favor. Do not repeat what you have heard from people without checking it out in light of Scripture. We have a relationship with the triune God and we have a religion. James 1. 26 to 27. Let's look at it. James 1, 26 to 27. Thank first and last. He's here to post verses for us. And then we're going to turn this objection against the Muslim because they demand that Jesus has to say it. All right. Watch what's going to happen. Is first and last here or did he leave? Oh, he left? Oh, my goodness. What happened? Why did he leave? I didn't even see him. What, did he say what, he was leaving? Hmm, interesting. I thought he's here. Sorry, okay, I'm going to read it. James 1, 26 to 27. Okay. Okay, let me read it until he gets back. James 1, 26 to 27, guys. I'm going to read it out loud. Pay attention. Let's not repeat these myths or these traditions that are not based on Scripture. If anyone among you seems to be religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is, is vain. If you can't control your tongue from slandering people, from gossiping, from creating division, then your religion is useless. Religion that is pure, religion that is pure and undefiled before God. See, there is a religion, pure, undefiled, that God accepts before God the Father is this. Here's the religion that God the Father delights in that is pure and undefiled in his sight. Visit the fatherless and widows. Take care of those in need in their affliction and keep oneself unstained by the world. You have 66 books of instruction telling you how to keep yourself undefiled from the world's pollution. And you're telling me you don't have religion? Can we stop this nonsense? I get tired of seeing Christians posting... I don't have religion. I have relationship. God ain't a religion. He's a relationship. Where are you getting this from? 
Where are you guys getting this from? Right? Can we stop that nonsense now? No more, right? See, what I want to do in these classes, I'm trusting the spirit to protect me from error and give me wisdom, knowledge, and an understanding of the depth of scripture to teach you. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit teaching us through human vessels that he uses for his glory. And I pray I'm one of them for the glory of Jesus. And that I don't disqualify myself, that I'm a doer and I live out the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. One of the goals of these sessions is to teach you to know the Bible, interpret correctly, avoid mistakes and human tradition, and live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. That's what I want to do. That's why you notice I spend more time on biblical topics, less time on Islam. Even though people tell me, yeah, Sam Shamoon, apologist against Islam, one of the top apologists against Islam. I don't carry that as a badge of honor. You know why? I don't want to be known as someone who's an apologist against Islam. Yes, I'm not ashamed of it. And I do that. Expose Islam by the power of the Holy Spirit as David and others. But I want to be known as a student of the word who yielded to the spirit to be used of the spirit to teach others their faith on the basis of the Bible. A student of the Bible who teaches it to the best of his ability by the grace of God's spirit to bless other brothers and sisters in Christ, the members of the body of Christ. Now, let's come back. Let's thoroughly decimate this objection. So if a Muslim asks you, or did Jesus say, I am God, worship me. You know how to turn it against him, right? Or her. You, know, you guys know how to turn it against him or her, right? You got my answer, correct? Everyone got it? Okay. But let me answer the question for you guys, for your benefit. Let me answer the question thoroughly for your benefit. Are you ready? Why didn't Jesus simply come out and say, I am God or worship me? You ready for the answer? You ready for the answer, a more thorough answer? In the first place, right off the bat, it's an argument from silence. Why is it an argument from silence? Because we don't know if he did, we don't know if he didn't, because the Bible doesn't record everything Jesus said or did. John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. John 20, 30 to 31. Come on, admins, you're not fast enough. And many... Other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John 21, 24 to 25. Adam and Eve, you can be humble and still speak the truth. So if God says he's God, that means he's arrogant. Adam and Eve, don't answer a question that will be used against you. So Adam and Eve, according to you, because God in the Old Testament says he's God, he must be arrogant. That's not how you answer the question, Adam and Eve. So don't help me to help you. Let me help you by the grace of God. Okay. John 21, 24 to 25. Read with me. John 21, 24 to 25. Okay. Josh is not paying attention. Josh Hebel, don't chime in. Don't quote verses that don't answer the question. You're not answering the question. To say that Jesus claimed to be the Son in such a way to make him equal to the Father is not an answer to the question why Jesus didn't say, I am God in those exact words. Don't help me to help you. Let me help you by the grace of God. Sit in the saddle and listen and learn. John 21, 24 to 25. This is disciple which testify of these things and wrote these things. And we know that this his testimony is true. Now notice 25. And these are also... And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Did you catch what John said? Did you catch what John said? In two places, in John 20, 30 to 31, and John 21, 24 to 25, specifically 25, Jesus did many things, said many things 
in our presence, in the present disciples of whom I'm one. And we didn't write them down. At least I didn't write them down. But I wrote what is sufficient to result in your salvation by knowing Jesus truly and loving him and pleasing him. You with me there? Plian, we don't care what you consider us. We don't consider you a brother. You are a child of the devil. You're a son of Satan if you're not a Trinitarian. You're of the devil. You're not our brother. Repent. Okay? Everyone with me there? So number one, right off the bat, the Bible doesn't record everything Jesus said or did. So we don't know if Jesus did say, I am God, or whether he never said, I am God, in those ex exact words. It's an argument from silence. Are you with me there? Are you understanding how to answer this objection? No, the blind man did not acknowledge him as God. You see, zero one, you're chiming in again. Zero one, I guess I'm not doing a good job of communicating. Zero one, I will give you a million dollars and first last will become Muslim and take Shahada. If you show me in John 9, 35 to 38, where the blind man worshiped Jesus as God, when the context shows he worshiped him as the son of God. You are begging the question by assuming your definition of these terms, and you're going to embarrass yourself, zero, one. You guys, you still don't get it, right? Stop pontificating, chiming in, because you're not answering the question adequately. You're going to embarrass yourselves. That's why I'm correcting you so you don't make this mistake to a Muslim or a Jehovah's Witness and be embarrassed. And you wonder why I'm tough with you? I'd rather put you on the spot and correct you so you don't make this mistake in front of unbelievers and embarrass yourself and your witness. Pat, Pat, what has that got to do with the Gospel of John clearly saying many things Jesus did that the Gospel of John did not record? Why are you going on a tangent? No, zero one. Let's try this again. The objection is, where did Jesus say, I am God? Not where he said, I am the son of God. Many sons of God, some of whom were worshipped like David. David is a son of God who was worshipped in 1 Chronicles 29, 20. Zero one, why are you arguing with me? Do you want to learn? You want to benefit? You want to be the best witness possible? Or do you want to just argue and get nowhere? What do you want? You tell me, zero one, how I can help you. Because obviously me correcting is not working. How do you want me to help you, zero one? Tell me. How do you want me to help you? I'm trying to help you, but it's not working. Oh, son of God is not good enough? No, it's not, because the question is, show me where he says I am God. They're ready to respond to your assertion that Jesus said he's the son of God. Two path, that doesn't work either. Two path, I think I want to make an example out of you because you're not following me. They'll show you that Jesus' miracles are paralleled by others in the Old Testament. Elijah and Elisha raised the dead and also multiply food see you guys really are not ready for apologetics if this is how you're going to argue you guys are really not ready for apologetics and this is where i'm kind of shocked and i'm re really discombobulated let me tell you why if you guys have been following david wood christian prince usama Dakto, al fadi and me for years and this is still the best level or the best arguments you have, honestly, I'm going to have to say, we either suck as teachers or you guys are terrible listeners. Right? You are terrible listeners because you're using the same arguments that the Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses and anti-Trinitarians are prepared to respond to, even though we've told you this is how they're going to respond and this is the refutation to leave them with no excuse and demolish every argument until you take every thought and heart captive for Jesus. Why are you guys still repeating the same weak arguments? No, Dutch prophet, you're wrong. Jesus was sent to reveal who he was, did make divine claims, and not simply die for us. So you're wrong, Dutch. See, so you're speaking again. Dutch, I think I'm going to make you an example out of you by blocking you. What I think so. Josh Herbal, Revelation 1.8 does not prove that it's Jesus speaking. Someone can tell he's God the Father. 
My goodness. Wow. Gerson. Gerson, first and last, we'll take Shahada if you can prove from Mark 14.62 that Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. Mark 14.62, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. All you proved was the Jehovah Witness argument that Jesus claimed to be a subordinate deity, a second deity subject to the true God, inferior to the true God. No, I'm glad these examples are coming up, Adam and Eve. I'm glad these examples are coming up because it shows either you guys are not listening well or you are listening, but it's not sinking in because you're using arguments that can be turned against you. Okay. I didn't know that, Pat Pat. I thought you listened to other Christians who teach you how to respond. All right. My apologies, Pat Pat. Okay. Let me tell you the problem. Here's where I want to let I'm going to ask you guys. Don't pontificate. Don't chime in. Don't give me what you think is a good answer. I need your undivided attention for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you guys listening now? Ben Christian, Revelation 5, 12 to 14, knockout, brother. I'll kiss you on your head. Knockout, my friend, Ben Christian. Kiss you on your head. Beautiful. Thank the Lord. You're listening. I love you, sir. Not got argument, especially if you unpack its implications. Okay. Let me now, I am going to tell you, if you be patient, I'm trying to catch up with every one of you. Okay. Many of you throughout a lot of passages, and I'm trying to keep up. So, Sai Christian, be patient. I'm trying to keep up with everyone. See, now Walter brought John 14, and for the life of me, I don't know how John 14. Uh, we were sailing along in the moonlight bay. All right, let's come back. Let's come back. Let me tell you how Mark 14, 62 will not prove your case. Okay, why? In Mark 14, 62, listen to me, guys. I'm going to need to listen. Jesus claims to be the son of man of Daniel who rides the clouds of heaven. And David's Lord who sits at God's right hand. Did you know what you prove by citing those passages? That Jesus is a subordinate deity subject to God the Father. Can I explain to you why and how? That's how an anti-Trinitarian is going to respond. An anti-Trinitarian is going to respond this way to show you, you didn't prove that Jesus is God Almighty equal to the Father. Are you ready for the objection from the other side so you're prepared to answer? Okay. Okay. Antares, do you want me to send you on your merry way and block you for barking? Or are you going to be patient? And let me answer. Okay. In Daniel 7, the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is already on the throne. The Son of Man is not. The Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days and it receives a kingdom. Are you paying attention? Paying attention? Okay. The Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, and he's given a kingdom. The Ancient of Days is already on a throne, but the Son of Man has to be given a throne and a kingdom. Question. This is the objection now. Why would the Son of Man need to be given a kingdom from the Ancient of Days if he's God by nature and already the king by nature? Why does he have to be enthroned by someone else? And that someone else isn't enthroned by anyone. He's already on the throne. You see the objection? Gerson, is, Gerson can you put down the pipe, son? Because you're not answering anything. See, this is what happens when you pretend that you're, you're not answered. Psalm 110.1. Let me tell you now Psalm 110.1. Because that's what Jesus says, sitting at the right hand of the power. That's an allusion to Psalm 110.1. Here's the problem. There it says, Jehovah said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Here's the objection by the anti-Trinitarian. Why does Jehovah need to invite David's Lord to sit on the throne with him if David's Lord is God by nature and he's already on the throne? So the two passages that you cited shows that whoever this being is, there is another who's enthroning him. There is another giving him the right to rule. There's another giving him a throne and power and glory. Why does he need to receive that from another if he's God by nature? Have you ever thought about those objections? 
Have you ever thought about those objections? Thank you, Josh Herbal. Good. So you're saying what? If you thought about it, if you thought about it, then why are you now repeating the same arguments without being prepared to respond to the objections? Okay, Pat, you said no answers. Very simple. Very simple. If we take for granted Psalm 110 and Daniel 7 are genuine prophecies of the Messiah, okay, then the New Testament tells us the meaning, application, and fulfillment of these prophecies, right? No, basic in order. Not really. Right? Sorry. You with me there? So if we let the New Testament inform our understanding of these prophecies the answer is simple folks the answer is simple it is simple as day you know what it is someone answered it not so much that jesus became mortal that's part of it no not even philippians 2 even though philippians 2 addresses it but everyone wants to philippians 2 for some reason it's like as if matthew mark luke and john are inadequate to address the issue we need to run to philippians 2 right the answer is simple because as far as the Gospels are concerned, these prophecies are fulfilled after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Yes, it has to do with Jesus' condescension. That when he came to the earth to become man, he set aside his authority as king, took on the status of a slave. So what Daniel and David are seeing, seeing they are seeing the enthronement of the Son of God after humbling himself to die on the cross and then being exalted to the status that he had before he humbled himself, which he voluntarily set aside. You get it? You understand the answer? Very simple, not complex. The New Testament explains to us why Daniel and David could speak of this figure being enthroned by someone else, being exalted by someone else, and receiving a kingdom from someone else, not because he's a creature and inferior, but because from the New Testament perspective, this being is being exalted after voluntarily humbling himself to take the status of a servant. And you know where you find this beautifully articulated? Isaiah 52, verses 13 to Isaiah 53, verse 12. Because there it talks about the servant being high and lifted up. And I did a session, and I have articles on this, explaining that when Jehovah says, my servant will be high and lifted up, those two words are used elsewhere in the book of Isaiah to speak of God sitting enthroned in heaven above all creation. Same two words used elsewhere in Isaiah for God's enthronement in heaven above all creation. And yet the servant is exalted to that status of glory and power after dying for the sins of God's people and offering his life as a guilt offering. So even Isaiah 52 13 to Isaiah 53, verse 12, beautifully captures all of this. That the servant humbled himself to the point of dying for our sins, and God then responds to that willful act of <clears throat> submission and humiliation by then exalting him to his th heavenly throne. No, it's not confusing, Pat. You're confused because you don't know the Trinity. Why can't Jesus sit on the right side of God when their God is the Father and Jesus isn't the Father? What's confusing? Yes, Hayden Tang. Yes, you got it, Hayden Tang. Jesus reclaiming the full majesty he had that he voluntarily set aside to come to the earth as a servant. 
So what David is seeing and what Daniel is seeing is the Messiah's enthronement after humbling himself on the earth and dying an accursed death. Everyone got it now? Okay. Let's now prove it. Are you now ready for me to walk you through the gospel's explicit testimony that Jesus on earth, though a king, set aside his authority and his glory and his exalted status to become a servant on earth? I don't need Philippians 2 to make that point. Everyone runs to Philippians 2, but hardly anyone goes to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? Are you ready now for the evidence? You ready? We'll begin. Do all of the Gospels affirm Jesus on earth didn't function in his capacity as a king? Didn't exercise his kingly authority, but set it aside to be a servant to the Father. Is this the teaching of the four Gospels? I know everyone wants the Philippians 2. Philippians 2 is beautiful. But someone like a Bart Ehrman or a Muslim who does not believe that the Bible's consistent, say, well, that's Paul. That doesn't tell me that's what Matthew believed or Mark believed or Luke believed or John believed. Stop quoting Paul to explain Matthew. Right? You with me there? Someone who doesn't believe the Bible is consistent will tell you, why are you quoting Paul to explain Matthew? Paul's theology is different from Paul. And this is why I get frustrated when my brothers and sisters in Christ will run to Paul to answer a question from Matthew or Mark. Because they're setting themselves up for embarrassment. Because a Shabir Ali or a Bartram will say, well, that's Paul. That's not Mark. Paul had a different view from Mark. You can't tell me. What Mark meant by going to Paul. Prove your position. Prove your interpretation. Prove your belief from the very writer, from the very author, or from that specific writing by a specific author. Use that person, that writing, that your enemy is using to silence him for the glory of Jesus. Only JW says Jesus died, son died, then you're a moron, Antares. You have no idea what you're talking about. You're a waste of my time. Get him out of here. Send this guy out of here. That only JW says the son died. Okay, now let's go to Matthew 12, 17 to 21. Come on, admins, quick. Matthew 12, 17 to 21. I'm going to start now removing people from being admins. You're too slow. Matthew 12, 17 to 21. Let's read. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Here, Jesus fulfills this prophecy, one of the servant songs of Isaiah. Behold, my servant. Did you catch language? Jesus fulfills Isaiah 42, where he becomes the servant for Jehovah, the servant of the Father. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgments, judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. <clears throat> A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So Matthew confirms Jesus is on earth as a servant to the Father. If he's a servant to the Father, is he a king on earth? If he's a servant to the Father on earth, is he a king on earth? Okay. Luke 22, 27. Luke 22, 27. Jesus speaking, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, he who sits to eat, or he that serveth. Is not he that sitteth at meat, the one who sits to eat, is greater in position than the servant? Not in essence, not in value, but in position. But I am among you as he that serveth. Do you see Jesus speaking? I came as a servant 
I'm among you as a servant. And as a servant, I'm serving you. So I'm humbling myself to the point that I'm allowing you to be greater than me. You understand what Jesus is saying? I'm here to serve you. I'm here to wash your feet, meaning that I am humbling myself to make you of a higher status than me, even though I'm your God and your creator and life giver. Right? Does Mark agree? Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Does Mark agree? Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. I didn't come for you to serve me, but to minister. I came to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agreed, folks. Jesus on earth was a servant to the Father and a servant to mankind. He willfully, voluntarily made himself not just lesser than the Father in position and glory. He made himself lesser than the angels in position and lesser than the human beings that he came to serve. But you're asking me questions that you're killing me because it's in front of your face. Don't tell me you don't understand what you're reading. You with me there? So Jesus on earth became the servant of the Father and made himself lesser than the Father in position and glory. But not only did he make himself lesser than the Father in position, he became lesser than the angels in position and lesser than the human beings that he came to serve. So to answer the question, Pat, it's in front of you. You can get it. Don't make it harder than it is. Come on, Pat. By becoming the father's servant, he became the servant of mankind because the father's will was that he would come to serve mankind by dying for them. So let me repeat the question. If Jesus is on earth as a servant, if Jesus is on earth as a servant, was he on earth as a king? Was he functioning in his role as a king? Was he carrying out the prerogatives and the authority that he had as a king? So then why would it surprise you after he finished his work on earth, after he rose again, the Bible says the father gives him a kingdom. What would you expect the father to do if Jesus has humbled himself on earth to become a servant, to then exalt him to his kingly status, to his glorious status, the status he enjoyed before he came down, which he voluntarily set aside. Of course the father is going to give him the kingdom. Where's the problem? Where's the problem? Does John agree that Jesus on earth didn't function as a king, but as a servant. Does John agree? Did he agree? John 13, verses 3 to 17. Folks, if after this, I go through this, and you still don't know how to answer this question, then I'm a terrible teacher or you're terrible listeners. John 13, verses 3 to 17. Guys, read. No distraction. Focus. John 13, 3 to 17. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, right? He riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. Pay attention. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. If you guys don't know the custom at the time, the servants in the house would bring feet and wash the feet of the guest. That's what servants did, servants in the house, household servants. Notice what Jesus did. He assumed the role of a household servant. He's the one who gets up and washes the feet of the disciples, one of whom was Judas, putting himself even beneath Judas, washing the stinking feet of a Judas, right? Began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, 
You don't understand what I'm doing right now, Peter. What I'm doing, you don't understand why I'm doing it. But thou shalt know hereafter. You'll get it later why I'm humbling myself to wash your stinking feet. Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. In other words, you're too good for this. You're better than this. You're better than me. To stoop down and wash my feet? Never. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. He insists, you better let me wash your feet. And if you don't want, let me wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. He's insisting, I have to wash your feet. All right? Now let's continue reading. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Then wash me completely, all of me, if you insist. Right? Now let's read what, what Jesus says. Let's go on. <clears throat> Verse 9. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my feet. Jesus said to him, he that is washed needeth not to not save to wash his feet. Now, you guys, you guys want to understand the historical context. When people travel, they would wear sandals and dust would get in their feet. So you could have bathed that morning, but still your feet get dusty. So that's what he means. If you've already washed, then only your feet need to be clean because only your feet got dusty from wearing sandals and walking, you know, <clears throat> outside. So this is Jesus' point. Historically, it makes perfect sense what he's saying to them, right? He that is washed needeth not to save, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Now let's keep reading, right? <clears throat> For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now 12, all the way down. 12 all the way down. So after he had washed their feet, Judas being there too, and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Do you understand what I just did? Do you understand what this is all about? Me washing your feet? Now notice 13 and 14, verses 13 and 14. Ye call me master and Lord. You call me your teacher and Lord. Not just teacher, but Lord. And ye say, well, for so I am. I am the teacher and the Lord. You are right to call me that. If I then, the Lord and master, your Lord and master, literally the Lord and master. If I, who am the Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. I have set an example for you to follow. That you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And then 17, if you knew these things, happy are ye if you do them. Do you see what Jesus just did? I am the Lord and the master. I am your Lord and your master. I am the Lord and the master. And yet I humbled myself to wash your dirty feet, putting myself beneath you. How dare you think you're better than your brother and sister when you're not as good as me? And yet I'm willing to humble myself before you. Everyone caught it? If you know the Bible... And if you understand it by the power of the Holy Spirit and believe it with all your heart and love the word and seek to live it out, these objections are easily answered. Why would the Son of Man of Daniel 7 and David's Lord of Psalm 110 be given a kingdom to reign on? Because the New Testament tells us that Son of Man of Daniel that Daniel saw, David's Lord whom David saw, is Jesus who was on earth as a servant, as a slave, making himself lesser than the Father in position of glory, lesser than even the human beings that he came to serve. And now that he accomplished God's will perfectly, he's now being exalted to that status that he enjoyed, but set aside voluntarily. So where's the problem? Where's the problem? But you guys... Need to be aware of the objections to Mark 14, 62 and respond to them, leaving the anti-Trinitarian with no excuse for his unbelief, destroying every argument, taking them captive before the feet of Jesus. But you're not going to do this by simply quoting passages that your team will say, yay, 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 rah, rah, rah. 
Yeah, if you quote Mark 14, 62 to me, I know what it means by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Jehovah Witness, Muslim Unitarian says, oh, not so fast. That passage shows that the Father is greater than Jesus because the Son of Man has to be given authority. How can he be equal? See, you're not thinking. You understand the point? And as you dig deeper into the word, you see how deep the word is, how beautiful the word is, how amazing the word is, how supernaturally consistent it is, how amazing and beautiful and glorious our God is, and how loving and compassionate Jesus is. And it makes you fall more in love. If you stop reading surface level, right? And stop just, you know, sticking among your own and just rah rah the whole team. Rah, rah, yeah, whoo. Let yourself engage the other side. Let yourself engage the objections and trust the Holy Spirit to preserve you and guide you into all truth and perfect you and show you the great depth and beauty of Scripture as you demolish these arguments, falling more in love with Jesus. Right? John 18, 36 to 37. John 18, 36 to 37. I don't understand what you mean. Not enough hours. Pat, I'm sensing you're, you're probably a troublemaker. I don't think you're going to last too long in this room. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Guys, did you catch it? Guys, listen. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. And then verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. You even acknowledge it. You even admit it. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Folks, could Jesus be any plainer in John? My kingdom is not of this world. So on earth, was he a king? He just said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. Did you guys catch it? Okay, so if his kingdom is not of this world, while he was on this earth, was he a king? But I don't know if it sunk in. He goes, my kingdom is from somewhere else. Where is his kingdom from? Where is his kingdom from? His kingdom is from heaven? Okay, we have a problem though. There's only one king in heaven, Jehovah. There is no other king in heaven besides Jehovah. How can then Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world. It's from another place, meaning heaven, if he's not Jehovah. So when he goes to heaven and he sits on the throne with the father, the only reason why the father could even allow him to sit on the throne with him is because Jesus is worthy of that throne. Because like the Father, he's Jehovah God. Otherwise, he could not sit on the throne with Jehovah. He'd have to be standing in attention with the rest of the host of heaven. 1 Kings 22, 19. 1 King, Kings 22, 19. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of Jehovah. I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Did you catch it? 1 Kings 22, 19. All the hosts, all angelic creatures are standing on the right and left to Jehovah. Jesus sits with the Father on the throne. Jesus, how can you sit on the throne with the Father and how can heaven be your kingdom when heaven is God's kingdom and he alone sits on the throne? And why would the Father allow you to sit on the throne in heaven in his kingdom if you're a creature? Hmm. Psalm 113, verse 5. Psalm 113, verse 5. Psalm 113, verse 5.
Who is like unto Jehovah our God who dwelleth on high? Guys, rhetorical question. Psalm 113, verse 5. Who is like, uh, like unto Jehovah our God who dwelleth on high? What's the answer? Who is like Jehovah our God who dwells on high? What's the answer? It's a rhetorical question. But wait, Psalm 110.1 says, David's Lord sits with Jehovah on high. The same Psalms, the collection of Psalms, says David's Lord sits with Jehovah on Jehovah's right side on high. Psalm 110 verse 1, a Psalm of David, Jehovah said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, I'm confused. There's no one like Jehovah who dwells on high. David's Lord is exactly like Jehovah because he dwells on high with Jehovah, sits on Jehovah's right hand on Jehovah's throne. Because where is Jehovah seated? Here it says that David's Lord was told by Jehovah, Jehovah says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand. But Jehovah, where are you seated? Psalm 103, 19. Psalm 103, 19. Psalm 103, 19. Jehovah hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. So his throne is in heaven. That's where he sits. There's no one like Jehovah, our God, who dwells on high. And his throne is in heaven. And then go to Psalm 11, verse 4. Psalm 11, verse 4. Psalm 11, verse 4. Jehovah is in his holy temple. Jehovah's throne is in heaven. Jehovah's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. His throne is in heaven, but he looks upon the children of men. Psalm 2, verse 4. Excuse me, Psalm 2, verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord Adonai shall have them in derision. So who is like Jehovah our God who dwelleth on high? No one's like him. There's only one throne. He sits on it. All the hosts of heaven are standing. He sits the throne in heaven. His throne is in heaven. Psalm 115, verse 16. For the seal, to seal it. Psalm 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are Jehovah's. The heavens belong to him. He hasn't given it to anyone else. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. So God allows human beings to rule on the earth and over the earth. But the heavens belong to Jehovah. Okay, guys, understand what you just read. The heaven, all of the heavens, the entire heavens are Jehovah's possession. The earth he's given it to men. Who is like Jehovah our God who dwells on high? No one. Jehovah's throne is in heaven. He sits in throne in heaven. But wait, Jesus, you just said my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is heaven. Wait, David, you just said your Lord will sit with Jehovah on Jehovah's right hand. Hold on, Daniel. You saw thrones established. On one throne is the Ancient of Days. That's the Father. The other throne is for the Son of Man who then appears before the Ancient of Days, approaches the Ancient of Days, and sits on a throne alongside of him. What is going on? If there's no one like Jehovah who sits enthroned in heaven, the heavens belong to him alone, everyone else is standing, how is there someone else seated with him in heaven? I don't know what Captain Ron said. Do you guys catch it? Catch it? But then, how do we answer... How do we answer the objection? Why then is the kingdom given to him? It's given to him because he set it aside. It's given to him because he was a servant on earth. And as a servant on earth, he set aside his kingly authority and prerogatives. So it's given to him because he relinquished it and he's receiving it again. But a better question to ask the Unitarians is, how could he be given heaven's kingdom as his possession if he's a creature when the old testament's clear there is no creature enthroned with jehovah in heaven so turn that objection against them you should be answering the question how can he sit enthroned in heaven as a glorified man when heaven is the last place that you'll expect to find a creature ruling on the throne with jehovah in light of all these passages that say heavens belong to him no one's like him who sits enthroned how then can Jesus be given heaven as his kingdom, ruling from heaven? So you turn it against them. Psalm 
So you see what sounded like a good objection, actually, if you understand how to respond, is one of the most devastating refutations of anti-Trinitarian heresies and one of the strongest proofs for Jesus being God Almighty, one with the Father and the Spirit. If you understand what the Bible teaches and know how to answer these objections. You with me there? If you understand what the Bible teaches and are prepared to know what the other side is going to bring in response and how to then refute their objections because this argument needs to be turned against them. Unitarian, Muslim, you need to answer. How can a mere creature, and the Unitarian says Jesus is just a man, a human creature share the throne with Jehovah in heaven when the Bible is clear, the heavens belong to Jehovah, there's no one like him who sits enthroned in heaven. How then can he be a mere human creature since he's now ruling in heaven, from heaven, on the same throne, and heaven's kingdom belongs to him? You understand? But here's where you're going to covenant with me again. Here's where you're going to covenant with me again for the glory of Jesus. We're going to covenant with each other for the glory of Jesus. You're going to seriously pay attention to these arguments and seek the Holy Spirit's face to help you understand these arguments, <clears throat> recall these arguments, and use them for the glory of Christ. As you continue to pray for my miraculous well-being and my daughters and salvation from a corrupt system and a wicked or of the devil, a judge that's used of the devil to destroy the servants of God. And may she fail by the blood of Christ. That's how you're going to help me, right? You're going to help me to help you. You're going to help me show that God is using me to bless you. And the Spirit is taking you and I to a higher level of love, devotion, worship, trust, faithfulness, intimacy with our God, and a deeper, profound understanding of Scripture. And then you're going to absorb this information, live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ, and share it until this message <clears throat> engulfs the entire world, leaving no man with any excuse to reject the truth. Right? That's what I want. I want you to learn these arguments. And now let me show you how Jesus' words show the Quran is a false book, Muhammad is a false prophet, and Antichrist. Clearly, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was a servant on earth who set aside his kingdom and his kingdom prerogatives, privileges, and honor for a season, right? Right? Exactly, King of Kings. I'm doing it because I trust Jesus is calling me to do it in obedience to him to show my love for him and out of my love for you because he loves you. Otherwise, why do it? Why would David do, do what he do, does? Why would CP? Why are we doing it? Why not just... Live our life till we die. Because there's more to this life than just living for this world. We live for the one who is life, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, let me show you I turn this against the Muslim. Notice what Jesus said, what the gospel writers say. Jesus is on earth as a servant, as a slave. Therefore, he set aside his kingdom. But that same Jesus testifies he is the Son of God, who is the heir of the Father whose heavenly kingdom belongs to him, right? Matthew 13, 41 and 43. Matthew 13, 41 and 43. Matthew 13, 41 and 43. Let's read it. Jesus speaking, Matthew 13, 41, 43. Notice what Jesus says, folks. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. Notice he's the Son of Man. He owns the angels of heaven. The Son of Man sent forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom. Wow. Jesus, the Son of Man, it's his kingdom, and <clears throat> they are his angels. And his angels will cast out of his kingdom when he establishes it on earth, all things that offend and them which do iniquity. But whose kingdom is it? Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Okay, wait. The Son of Man's kingdom, which will soon be revealed on earth. The Son of Man's heavenly kingdom will come down to the earth. His kingdom is the Father's kingdom. 
The Father's kingdom is Jesus' kingdom, and their kingdom they will share with us believers. And the angels belong to the Son of Man. Wow. Matthew 16, 27 and 28. Matthew 16, 27 and 28. <clears throat> For the Son of Man, pay attention here. Jesus speaking of himself as the Son of Man. How do we know it's speaking of himself? Because notice, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. Of his Father. See, it was only a matter of time before Pat Pat exposed herself as a filthy prostitute of the devil, a daughter of the devil. You see? Then we spot it, this wicked demon, Satan. Glory to Jesus, he exposes these demons who pretend to be something they're not. Because they're like their father, the devil. Matthew 16, 27, 28. Pay attention. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. So God is the Father of the Son of Man. Meaning the Son of Man is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father. So God is the Father, the Son of Man. Meaning the Son of Man is the Son of God. There's no way around this being Jesus. Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Here again, the Son of Man, Jesus says, the angels belong to him. And then he, the Son of Man, shall reward every man according to his works. In case you didn't get it, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So is it clear? Jesus is the Son of Man, who's the Son of God, who owns the heavenly kingdom with the Father. So the Father's heavenly kingdom is the Son of Man's heavenly kingdom. And the Father's kingdom, which belongs to the Son, will be established on earth when Christ comes. Is that clear? <clears throat> you getting it? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Let's break this down because we're going to turn it against Islam in a minute. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jasper, that's very easy for me to answer, but I don't think you want an answer, and I'll humiliate you if I answer. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Let's read. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Let's park it there. Now that you know what the Bible teaches, and now that you know why Jesus can be given a kingdom, let's see if you can answer this objection, because this is an objection raised by Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims and Unitarians. If Jesus is God Almighty... Why does he need to be given power? And the word power here means kingly power, kingly authority, kingly sovereignty. All sovereignty is given unto me in heaven and earth. Why would Jesus be, be given kingly authority, sovereign authority over creation if he's already God? And as God, he would already possess that authority. So why is he receiving sovereignty, kingly authority? <clears throat> What's the answer? Why is he receiving it? Why is it given to him? If he's God, he already possesses it. What's the Come on, guys. I spent about an hour answering this. If not, I'm shutting down. Let's see. Adam, that didn't answer the question, so don't tap dance. I want to see if you've been paying attention. Ron, he's still flesh in heaven. How's that an answer? You guys got it. You guys got it. Stephen, man, I was about to lose hope in humanity and shut down the YouTube channel. John Doe? Yep, you got it. Because he became a servant on earth and set aside his kingly prerogatives, privileges, and glory. So now that he did that, he accomplished God's will perfectly. Now he's receiving that authority that he had set aside. So what is the Messiah? How does that answer the question, Apocalypse? Stop pretending to be answering a question that doesn't answer the question. So what is the Messiah? Did you get it, King of Kings, or no? You guys got it? You sure you got it? I don't know what 1919 means. I don't know what 1919 means, Kings. Okay. 
And then you have to prove it from Matthew. That's the case. What in Matthew proves that Jesus is being given a power that he set aside because on earth he was a servant? What in Matthew proves that? We quoted it earlier, but I know we don't remember most of what we hear. No, he's not the heir of the Father because he's Messiah. He's the heir of the Father because he's the Son of God. Don't confuse the two, Apocalypse. Pontificate again, and i got to block you because you're not learning your lesson. See, first and last is getting it. He got it. What in Matthew shows us that Jesus, because he was, that's not in Matthew, Rebel Mark. So you're not paying attention, see? That's why I got to keep tearing into you guys lovingly. What in, see, even King of Kings didn't get it. I'll give Rebel and King of Kings a million dollars to show me where in Matthew it says he washed their feet. You see, you guys are not paying attention. You guys are a disappointment, seriously. And you wonder why I'm being rough with you guys. Because if I baby you and took years, you're going to be a little, you know, wishy-washy effeminate Christians. You want me to be honest? Can you show me where Jesus washed anyone's feet in Matthew? What in Matthew? What in Matthew shows us that Jesus was a servant explaining why he'd be given power after he finished his role on earth? One guy got it. Only one person. What does that got to do with Matthew, Remy? What in Matthew? Anyone? You see why we're creatures of repetition? We need to hear something over and over again. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you. You gave me hope for humanity. Did you guys forget what we read in Matthew 12, 17, 21? Of course, because you're not paying attention. Sorry, you're not paying attention. Didn't Matthew say this is to fulfill what Esaias the prophet wrote? Behold my servant. From who I delight. Matthew 12, 17 and 18. Did you catch it? So Matthew has already told you. Jesus came to earth. To fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 4. That he becomes a servant of the father. Why couldn't you remember this passage? Because you guys have terrible attention spans. Terrible. Honestly. And did you know, Javed, that Muhammad, your prophet, denied he was human? He actually claimed to be a dog possessed of the devil. Did you know that? You got it now? Making sense? Now, I bet you I ask you the question again, you guys won't answer, even though we just gave you the answer. What in Matthew shows you that Jesus is being given a power that he had, but he set aside because he was a servant? See, I'm going to do it right now. I gave you the answer. Let's see. What in Matthew? Okay, good. All right. You really scared me. You would, you would make me throw myself off out of the first floor window, first floor window here, if you didn't answer. Yeah, Isaiah's prophecy in Matthew 12, 17 to 21. Right? Okay, so now that explains Matthew 28, 18, right? Now you guys can surprise me. You can be real bad, King of Kings. Okay? Matthew 28, 18. So now it makes sense all authority. And heaven and earth has been given to me. But now you turn it against the Unitarian or the Muslim. How could God entrust the sovereignty of the heavens and earth to a creature? How can a creature oversee the entire creation? <clears throat> and why would God enthrone a creature to share in his sovereignty over the entire creation, making the entire creation subject to him, which would include Muhammad and all Muslims? You want me there? You got it? Now let's read Matthew 28, 19 to 20. So you see where I'm going with, with this. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. So you see where I'm going with this. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching and observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now let's break this down. Let's bring out the meat. Jesus gives his personal promise to all believers. I will be personally with every one of you, not physically. In my physical glorified body, I'll be in heaven. But I will be personally present, personally with all of you, no matter how numerous, in order to guarantee the success in light of the commission. You're going to make disciples of all nations. And don't, be, don't worry about your success or failure or whether the nations will try to kill you or stop you from accomplishing my will for you of making disciples of all nations. You know why you shouldn't worry about it? Because I'll be with all of you. I am with all of you to the end of the world. No, it's not the Holy Spirit, BMW. Speak less, listen more, okay? Send Chris on his merry way. Take care. Bye-bye, Chris. Don't come back. Lord bless you and thank you for your feigned love, but bye-bye. Now, let's focus here. Here, Jesus said, I am with all of you to the end of the age. And the context is, I'm going to send you out throughout the whole world to make disciples of all nations. You will be successful. You will make disciples of all nations. No one's going to stop you from being successful because I'll be with all of you to guarantee your success. What attributes is Jesus claiming to possess in order to guarantee that he'll be with all believers ensuring the success of their mission? What attributes? Omnipresence, obviously, because he's going to be personally present with every one of them, overseeing them. But he must be omniscient because he has to know where they're at, where they're going, what they're doing, and omnipotent. He must be so powerful to guarantee that no one will stop them from making disciples and perfectly accomplishing his commission. So in that very small section Jesus claims to possess absolute sovereign authority over all creation. All creation, everything in heaven and earth, subject to him, belongs to him. He owns it all, meaning he owns Muhammad. He owns all Muslims. Everything's under his authority, under his sovereign rule. And then he claims to be all-powerful, present everywhere, all-knowing. But then in verse 19, he says, The name of the Father is the name of the Son is the name of the Holy Spirit. One name, the name of of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Not names. One name of the Father, which is the name of the Son, which is the name of the Spirit. Showing that Jesus and the Spirit possess and share in the unique name, unique authority, characteristics of the Father. Now you challenge a Muslim to say, challenge a Muslim to say, send Jasmi to perdition. Send him to perdition. Challenge a Muslim to say, in the name of Allah and Muhammad and Gabriel. Say, I challenge you to say, in the name of Allah and Muhammad and Gabriel. Or better yet, I challenge you to say, in the name of Allah, the messenger of Allah and the angel Gabriel. I challenge you to say, in the name of Allah, the messenger of Allah and the angel of Revelation. Challenge him to say that. Record it and post it online. You get it? Adam and Eve is on our side. You get it? Do you know why you want to challenge them to say that? You know why? To show that what Jesus said, no creature can say, no creature can unite himself with God in the same name. No creature can group himself with God under the divine name, claiming that he possesses the name that belongs to God. No creature can assert that. You see where I'm going with this? Is it sinking in? Is it making sense? Are you seeing to meet the depth of Matthew 28, 17 to 20, the Great Commission? We started at 18. We didn't start at 17. That's fine. Because there it says, the disciples saw him and worshiped, but some doubted. But you see, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the meat of that section, the meat of Jesus saying he possesses absolute sovereign authority, power over all creation, everything in heaven and earth, subject to him under his authority and control. He possesses the same name that the Father and the Spirit share in common. As the Son, he possesses it. 
And as the son who possesses absolute sovereignty over all creation, he now sends forth his disciples by his power, preserving them, guaranteeing the success of their mission to make all disciples of all nations, bringing them under the submission of the authority of Christ. You got it now? Now, how does this destroy Islam? How does this destroy Muhammad and the Quran? Notice again, Jesus is the son who shares the same name that the father and the spirit possess in common. The name of the father is the name of the son is the name of the spirit. By name, biblically speaking, by name, the word name biblically refers to the authority of a person and or his characteristics. So Jesus is saying, the power, the authority of the Father is the power and authority of the Son and the power and the authority of the Spirit. And what the Father is, the Son is, and the Spirit is, they're not the same person, but they possess the same authority and share the same characteristics, which is why everyone has to come under their authority and headship equally. You understand the point? The reason why you have to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, that act of baptism is an act of submission and surrender. You're saying, I come under the total control and authority and headship of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit equally. I belong to the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit equally. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are my head, have authority over me, own me, control me, and tell me what to do equally. That's what it means. It's a right performed to show your devotion, allegiance, and surrender to the deity. And notice the deity that you surrender to, submit to, and come under the authority of is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's why so many people attack Matthew 28, 19 as saying it's a later interpolation because it's a powerful witness to the essential equality of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You get it now? So as the son, he is the king. As the son, he is the king who owns all creation with the father and the spirit. Now, how does this destroy Islam? Let's go to chapter 25 of the Quran, verse 2. Chapter 25, verse 2. First, last, chapter 25, verse 2. two. Yes, he's infinitely beautiful. It, it is a bookend, Susan Baker. I'll explain that in a minute. 25 verse 2. How does Jesus' words in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 destroy Islam? Guys, read. Notice what the Quran says. He unto whom belongeth the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth. Sound familiar? He unto whom belongeth the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth. Jesus says, I'm that one. He hath chosen no son, nor hath he any partner in the sovereignty. He hath created everything and hath met it out for it a measure. So according to the Quran, the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth belong to Allah. He has no son who's his partner in the sovereignty. And Jesus says, Allah, you're a liar. Muhammad, you're a liar. Quran, you're a lie. I am the son of God, and I share in his sovereignty over the heavens and the earth. Send Vega on their merry way. You see what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 to 20? He's saying, Allah, you're a liar. Muhammad, you're a liar. The Quran, you're a lie. I am the son of God who possesses the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth that my father possesses. Evans, I haven't received word. I have no idea. Pray for miraculous protection. I'm getting tired of waiting for results and having to live like this. You get it, Pedro? Yes. The Quran is a satanic production, a production of Satan to attack biblical truths. You got it? You don't get any clearer that the Quran is anti-Christian, anti-Christ than what you just read in Surah 25, verse 2. Surah 25, verse 2 says, All sovereignty belongs to Allah in the heavens and the earth, and he has no son or partner in his kingdom. Jesus, before Muhammad was born, and now that he's damned and under the feet of Jesus, burning in hell, where he belongs, before Muhammad came, said, I am the son who possesses the name of the Father along with the Spirit, and I am the Son who possesses absolute sovereignty over the heavens and the earth with the Father and the Spirit. 
So who do you want me to follow? A dead man, Muhammad, or Jesus who conquered the grave, is alive, never to die, and who will come again. Even Muslims admit that. That he's alive and will come again. Right? So what did you learn again? You learned again. You got to listen to the objections carefully. Present the best case possible by the grace of God's spirit. Anticipate any objections against your case and demolish those objections, leaving people with no excuse for their unbelief. And this all started from answering the question, where did Jesus say I am God and how to turn that against the Mohammedan who dishonestly, deceitfully, and consistently uses an argument that you can turn more forcefully against him and his book. Yeah. Clear? It wasn't Christian Prince. It was a fake. Clear? Did everyone get it? Did it sink in? Did it make sense? Before I move on to the next point. Is that you, Christian Prince? I don't think so, because you don't go by that name on... On your YouTube channel. Isn't the Arabian prophet? Yeah, it doesn't matter whether they care about the answer, Lisa, or not. Your duty is to demolish the argument with the hopes that maybe there's someone in the crowd who's listening and the Spirit will convict them. You may be speaking to a person that's bringing an objection, but you don't realize the people around them, around that person is being affected. Okay. Okay, so if that sunk in, we explained the answer to the question, why didn't Jesus come out and say, I am God, worship me in those exact words. Let me now revisit the question. Let me finish the answer, but don't chime in. Don't pontificate. Don't try to help me answer the question because I don't want to go on another tangent. Though it wasn't a tangent, it was still a blessing because we went real deep into the scriptures, real, real deep into the Old and New Testaments, tied them together to show the beautiful supernatural divine consistency between the Old and New Testaments and their depiction of the Messiah as the God-man, one with the Father and the Spirit. Right? Okay. As I said, John 20, verse 30 and 31, and John 21, verse 25, both those passages teach, Jesus said and did many things not recorded. So it is possible that Jesus would have said, pay attention, it is possible that Jesus would have told his followers after receiving understanding, illumination, I am God, in those exact words. But we don't have a record of it. Now, let's put aside the possibility. Let's say at some point in his ministry, pay attention now. At some point in his ministry, Jesus did say it. He would have said it only after making sure they understood the relationship of the Godhead. Which brings me back to my second, the second part of my answer. In the first century, pay attention, folks. Don't be distracted by the devil. In the first century, the term God for a first century Jew would have meant the Father in heaven. The Father in heaven. So if Jesus went around saying, I'm God, then that would have confused his audience into thinking he's claiming to be the Father in heaven, and he's not. Let me give you a modern example. And you guys, get this argument. If you get this argument, then you'll see why Jesus didn't simply come out right away and say, I am God, because Jesus is the perfect communicator who communicates perfectly. And he wants people to understand, unless he's tired of them and their blasphemy, and then hands them over to their blindness and speaks in parables to further confuse them as part of their punishment. Okay, now, follow me. Follow with me. Let me give you a modern example. Okay. To a Jehovah Witness... Only the Father is Jehovah. To a Jehovah Witness, only the Father is Jehovah. The Father alone is Jehovah. So if I say to a Jehovah Witness, Jesus is Jehovah, what did I just tell him? To a Jehovah Witness who's been trained to think only the Father, the Father, Father alone is Jehovah. If I say Jesus is Jehovah, what did I just tell him? Who is Jesus? Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, first and last. So for a Jehovah Witness to say to him, Jesus is Jehovah, you just told him Jesus is the Father. 
No, Craig, you're not listening. Craig, let's try this again. Pretend you're listening, Craig. If a Jehovah Witness thinks the Father is Jehovah, if I say Jesus is Jehovah, in their mind, what did I say? Craig, pretend you're listening, friend, because you're, you're hurting me now. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, King of Kings. You got it. You guys got it. No, you're not, Zarina. Even you, Zarina, you're not paying attention. Zarina, pull away from your memes. Stop posting on Facebook and follow me, sister. You know, I love you, and I love to chew you up. This is going to make a better woman out of you. To a Jehovah Witness, the Father alone is Jehovah. So when you say Jehovah, they think Father. So if I say Jesus Jehovah, in their mind, I just said Jesus the Father. So they're going to ask you, wait, wait, wait. If he's Jehovah, was he praying to himself? Did he send himself? Whose son is he? Because they don't define the word Jehovah in reference to the Trinity. You with me there? You understand? Let me use the Muslims now. In the Muslim mindset, Allah refers to, God refers to, Allah refers to the one who sent Jesus, the one who sent Moses. The one who sent Jesus, the one who sent Moses. So if I say in Arabic to a Muslim, Jesus is Allah, I just told him Jesus is the same one that sent him, whom we call the Father. Though they won't call him the Father, the one who sent Jesus to us is the Father. They'll say, yeah, he's God. So that means the Muslims are going to say, wait, you're saying Jesus is Allah? But Allah sent Jesus. So did Jesus send himself? You see the point? Exactly, King of Kings. You're getting it. So the worst way to communicate Jesus is God is to express it in such a manner that you confuse the people you're talking to. Right? Likewise, in the first century, to a first century Jew, to say Jesus is God meant he's the Father in heaven because they didn't use the term God for the Godhead. Though the Jews knew from their scriptures, there are multiple divine persons, such as the angel of Jehovah, the Holy Spirit. They limited the term God for the Father in heaven. So to say Jesus is God to them would mean the Father in heaven. <clears throat> so for Jesus to say, I am God, he would have confused them. They would have thought that he's claiming to be the Father in heaven. Since Jesus is the perfect communicator, how could Jesus claim to be God without Leading the Jews to assume that he is the Father. How could he say, I am God, without confusing them into thinking that he's saying, I am the Father? How? The way he communicates it in the Gospels. No better way for Jesus to have claimed to be God than the way he does in the Gospels. How? By claiming to be the Son of God who is not the Father, but equal to the Father, and therefore just as much God as the Father is. That's why the Jews got it. The Jews understood. You're not the Father, but you're claiming to be the Son in such a way that makes you equal to the Father, and therefore you're claiming to be God in the flesh. And out came the stones. Let me give you an example. John 5.18. John 5, 18, just for the sake of time to make it short. Okay. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he, he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father. So he's not the father. He's saying God is his father, making himself equal with God. Bam. That's number one. Another example, John 10, 30 to 33. John 10, 30 to 33. I and my father are one. So you're not the father. The father is someone else, but you're one with him. So they understood. You're not the father, but you're one with him. Now notice how they understood him. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from, the fa from my father. So notice my father. So not the father. They got that part. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, 
but for blasphemy and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. But wait, he didn't say I'm God. He didn't say I'm God. He said, I am my father one. He's my father. I'm his son. We're one. But they understood that the kind of unity he's claiming makes him God in the flesh. So you see, no better way for Jesus to claim to be God without confusing them into thinking he's the father than the way he did. I am not the father, destroying modalism as a satanic heresy, a lie of the devil. I am not the father. I am the son who's equal to the father and can do whatever he does because I'm one with him in glory and power and ability. Wow, so you think you're God. But hold on, he didn't say I'm God. He didn't have to. He just claimed to be the son of God who's equal to the father. So he's not the father, but to be equal to the father in that sense, he's claiming to be God too. And out came the stones. You got it? You understand? That's why we read in John 19, verse 7. John 19, verse 7. Notice what the Jews say to Pilate. John 19, verse 7. Notice what the Jews say to Pilate. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Folks, there's nothing blasphemous about claiming to be the son of God unless you claim to be the son of God in such a way that you're claiming to be equal with the God of heaven and one with him in glory, essence, power, and ability, which they thought wasn't true, could not be true, was false. Exactly wrong. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. You see? So again, why didn't Jesus just come out and say, I am God? The simple answer is because that's the worst way for Jesus to claim to be God to a first century Jewish audience that were taught and trained to assume that God meant the Father in heaven. And he's not the Father, showing that modalism, oneness theology is a satanic lie, a heresy of the devil, right? So what better way to claim to be God Almighty in the flesh yet not the Father? The way Jesus went about communicating his deity. You see? And once it sunk in, it sunk in. Oh, oh, oh. so the Father is not the only one who's God. The Son is God too, and the Spirit. And yet the Son and Spirit are not the same person as the Father. But they're God too. Once that sunk in, and they could see that the term God isn't limited to the Father in heaven, but now could be used for the Son and the Spirit without confusing the Son and the Spirit with each other or with the Father. Knowing the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. There are three eternal relationships, three distinct persons, but all of whom can be called God. Once that sunk in, once they understood that reality, now let's read John 20, 28 to 31. John 20, 28 to 31. John 20, 20 to 31. We had about 220. We're down to 190. What's going on, guys? I'm losing you. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Oh, Thomas, you just called Jesus your God. Do you mean the Father? No. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Is it a coincidence right after Thomas says Jesus is his God? John goes on to write, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, John, you just confused me. You just quoted Thomas saying Jesus is his God. He is my Lord and he is my God. And by extension, if he's Thomas is God, he's the God of all believers. And now you say he's the Son of God? What's going on, John? Yes, he is our God and he's the Son of our God. He is God, who's the Son of God, because Jesus is God in essence, who's the Son of God the Father. He's not the Father, but with the Father, he's our God, along with the Holy Spirit, who's also one with the Father and the Son, and therefore our God as well. Got it?
Is it a coincidence in the place in which Jesus is said to be Thomas's God right afterwards? John says he's also the son of God. And you'll find these qualifying statements throughout that in one place, Jesus is called God. And right away, he's distinguished from God. He's called God, but then distinguished from God. Just like John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. With God and was God. Was with God and was God. Right? Or in Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 9. Exactly. He is the I am in three eternal persons, three eternal relationships. Yeah, Al, you're going to listen. I'm almost done. I'm ending it, but it's going to be a powerful session besides distractions. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9. Now notice again, but unto the Son, he saith. So someone else, different from the Son, says to the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God. Ah, oh, you see the qualification? The Father says, Son, you are God who rules forever, but you have a God over you. So he is God, who is the Son of God, and the Father is his God. <whistles> Sinking in? You need to go back, re-listen to this session, ask Holy Spirit to help you separate the wheat from the chaff and save me from it, any error, not to repeat any mistakes. Let it sink in how to answer these objections and how not to answer these objections. No more inadequate replies. No more pat answers. Answers that may work with our fan base. Rah, 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 hooray. But won't work with anti-Trinitarians who are <clears throat> studying to demolish our position. I'm trying to give you the best information possible, the most accurate information, and prepare you for the objections and how to demolish those objections by the wisdom, knowledge, and power from the Holy Spirit to leave no one with an excuse to reject the clear teaching of the Bible. God is real. He is triune. Jesus is God in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. And the Bible is the word of the true God. I'm doing my best to equip you. Yes, uh, not on answering Muslim Sargon. I have answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Every week I update with an article or two, if not more. Answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I put it in the description box. And answeringislam.net, right? So I'm, I'm doing that. Now, guys. I hope you're blessed. I wasn't able to live stream. I haven't heard back from Chicago. Pray that's good news. Pray Jesus will keep me planted here. You guys, just by way of testimony, the favor that God has given me here locally is amazing, right? Things are happening for me. Like, man, yesterday the Lord showed up. Within two hours, I was able to get my license here, right, and do things. That should have taken me a long time to do, but within two hours, doors opened by the grace of the triune God as a sign to me that God is moving me in this direction and protecting me. And he's given me favor, abundant favor locally. The person that I'm speaking with here is a committed Christian who sees Jesus in me and is doing all this individual can to help me. To glorify Christ and save planet here. So I got a lot of blessing here. But in Chicago, the city of the devil, they're still trying to persecute me. Pray for the blood of Jesus to be my shield and my daughters and set me free and to provide for the ministry. Pray for that support to come in and God will preserve that support to get planted so I can have a place for my girls to come to me because I'm waiting for my daughters. Guys, pray. Christmas is around the corner. I haven't seen them and touched them and kissed them since June. And folks, there's not a day I don't wake up aching for them, aching to kiss them and love them and hold them again until Jesus takes me. Please, guys, pray for God to fight for me and to do things that are miraculous as a testimony to his goodness to me that doesn't deserve it because I shame him, may have mercy on me. And so their daughters will have their Baba in their life. Please, I need your prayers. I need Jesus to show up and ask him to keep me in love with him, to be pure and not to succumb. It's hard, and my daughters need Jesus, and they need their Baba. So please pray for me. Lord willing, I'll try to do a live stream this upcoming week. I don't know if I can do Sunday. Uh, if I can't do Sunday, I'll try to do it sometime. Well, you know what? Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, tomorrow. I forgot. Tomorrow live stream. 
Lord Jesus willing, on Vocab Malone's channel. Yeah, hit the like button, subscribe. Vocab Malone's channel, tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. New York Time. David Wood, the great white dope dictator, Vocab Malone and myself will be live streaming tomorrow, God willing, if the Lord Jesus wills, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right? That's New York Time on Vocab's YouTube channel. So look for us as I school Hater Wood. Christ is risen, risen indeed, and Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, wash us in your blood, fill us with your spirit, and help me, Lord. Help me to make you happy and not grieve your spirit, and please fight for my children. And Lord, please give me freedom from this mess. Please, in Jesus' name. Christ is risen, and we love you, Lord. Take care, guys. See you tomorrow. Lord willing.